everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our presenter. John Piotrowski is co-founder and CEO of The Ocean, a soon-to-launch cryptocurrency trading platform designed for safe, fast, and cheap algorithmic trading. He's a former Goldman Sachs VP who led trading strategy and capital optimization, and he's been trading FX, cryptocurrencies, and other products algorithmically for close to 10 years. He graduated with a BA in economics from the University of Virginia and an MS in financial math from New York University. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John now to take it away. Well, thank you so much for all of you attending today's presentation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm looking forward to tell you a little bit about the cryptocurrency market as we see it uh, at the ocean, as I see it as someone who actively trades and hopefully share some thoughts and insights. You know, per usual, I uh, just want to give a disclaimer that this is simply informative, not making specific recommendations. Um, but hoping that uh, you have some takeaways that you can think about and you know we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. Uh, I want to leave ample time uh, for folks to ask anything that comes to mind. So a, a few things I wanted to talk about, you know, people come from different levels of experience in the space and so wanted to try to bring uh, a litany of perspectives and levels of specificity, but make sure it's it's still accessible to folks just getting into the space. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other products, just generally how they work, what a blockchain is, what cryptocurrencies are, some facts about the marketplace as it exists today, trading opportunities that you know I and others see in the marketplace that might be interesting to explore, and then what are some of the challenges that are unique to the cryptocurrency trading marketplace uh, that you should also be keeping in mind as you try to potentially explore this market? So as was mentioned, a little bit more about me. Uh, I've been capital markets, banking, trading for about 10 years. Uh, I was you know, most recently at Goldman Sachs where I started my career in FIC and equities risk specifically, and then moved on to thinking about the whole firm. And that's partly how I originally got into blockchain and cryptocurrencies, thinking about, well, you know, this concept of moving financial value around in a less centralized, less risky, faster format sounds pretty attractive, um, whether you're a big player or a small player in the marketplace. And so how can we explore the space, think about, uh, its potential value on financial services in general, and try to bridge from a, a purely traditional financial world to a more decentralized financial world. And that's why I left Goldman earlier this year to work with uh, the rest of our founding team at the Ocean uh, to bring about that change. I wanna start by talking about the current landscape of cryptocurrency products that exist today. I'm sure many of you, if you're signed up for this webinar, at least have heard of Bitcoin, uh, potentially Ethereum. But I want to explore a little bit the, the concepts behind what these products actually mean, what they're trying to do. Um, some are more successful than others, why there's a proliferation, and why there's so much interest in the space. So, Let's take a step back and think about uh, the concept of a blockchain for a second. So if you're someone who likes reading technical jargon, uh, I suggest that you read the original Bitcoin white paper by the uh, still unknown author that, that went by Satoshi Nakamoto. You know, it was written in 2008. And so basically the genesis of this whole industry and new asset class comes from that paper written around the time of the financial crisis uh, about 10 years ago. And the genesis of that paper and that project is 
thinking about, well, financial services companies as they exist today and the system exists today is quite centralized. You have big hubs of risk and transactions, whether it's Goldman Sachs, exchanges, brokers, so on and so forth, that adds a lot of risks, costs, overhead to the system. And so is there something better? Uh, particularly if you think about email as a way to communicate, why can't we just email money around uh, in a similar fashion? Why, why would that fundamentally not work or not make sense? And the problem that blockchains, cryptography, and Bitcoin specifically tries to solve is around this double spend problem. Well, this concept of decentralized, no specific owner or printer of money that exists solely in electronic form is interesting. How do you make sure that me as someone who is trying to send money to someone else in the space uh, or in the world actually has what I say I have, um, actually has the ability to execute that transaction, actually has $100 in their bank account if it's in some ledger. And if they're trying to spend it at the same time uh, in two different places, well, which transaction takes priority? And how do you decrease somebody's balance and increase someone else's? And that's where this concept of blockchain comes in to context. And so, you know, Bitcoin, its blockchain is decentralized. It's a shared public ledger. And so different folks can write to it in transactions as they're processed. But how do you make sure those transactions are valid? You know, it starts with cryptography saying, okay, I'm the person who can access this account. I have a key that unlocks the balance in this account and lets me make transactions against that account. And then the second part of that puzzle is, well, how do I make sure then once I transact in that account that the rest of the network reflects that balance as well? Uh, and that's where the concept of consensus, and you might have heard something called Bitcoin mining proof of work, similar concepts. All they're trying to do is say, okay, well, we have this electronic record system. It's a public ledger. I give everybody keys to unlock and facilitate transactions. Well, then how do I make sure that I know the state of that ledger at any one point in time? Well, let's create a, a hash system or a cryptographic computational problem that computers can solve uh, that facilitates knowing the network at any one point in time. And it's important to get this right because otherwise, particularly in a decentralized network, I don't have a central counterparty. There's no central bank that I'm going to to print money. Instead, it's all of us who are deciding to transact in a decentralized fashion, trust each other. How do we enforce that trust? How do we make sure no one individual or node takes over the status of that network? Well, we need to create a, a rule set as a problem for computers to solve to ensure that case. And so that's, that's the, the concept of mining at a high level. And so all of these pieces, if you go to Ethereum, other blockchains, all have to have a view on how this works. Bitcoin, I, th this is a taxonomy. Uh, you know, something I would say even before getting to this slide, there is no, in many of the debates, questions, dialogues in cryptocurrency land, there is no single answer. There's still lots of debate on where the right approach is, right problems to solve, right terminology to use. So here's a way I think about this space a little bit. Um, others might have a different view, but I think it's non-controversial to say that Bitcoin is really the genesis of the cryptocurrency phenomenon. And it's all about, as we just talked about, how do I solve double spend how do we create a decentralized monetary system? Ethereum, which came out a few years later, uh, tries to extend that concept to say, well, we can have decentralized monetary systems. Why can't we have decentralized applications in general? Where well, I don't have to rely on a single server farm somewhere, a single set of computers, and trust that they're not hacked or taken advantage of. Can we create, instead of just being able to transact financial value, all types of transactions, um, contracts, applications, in a similarly distributed format? 
And that's the concept of Ethereum and smart contracts in a quote unquote world computer is, well, now I can create a, a distributed mechanism with the right consensus that backs it, that for any network problem, any computer problem, any application problem, we don't have to rely on single points of failure anymore, single institutions anymore. Uh, you, you hear a lot about this in the context of Facebook as one example where you can imagine a world in which you have a decentralized social media platform, and there are attempts at this in the space already, that look to not have any one single set of decision makers make decisions for everyone on the governance or functionality of a specific platform. How do we make a system that's computationally efficient uh, and sufficiently secure so that no one individual or node takes too much advantage, makes too much money off it, and so on. So that's, that's really the, the, the beauty of Ethereum is, is extending that Bitcoin concept, that financial concept to all types of applications. And now you see a proliferation of chains trying to do similar thing and tackle thornier problems still in the space with that Ethereum and other blockchains. And no one blockchain is really solved yet. Issues around scaling. If I have lots of decentralized applications running on lots of decentralized nodes, it can become computationally inefficient. Privacy. An interesting thing about Bitcoin, Ethereum, other chains is that they're public, they're anonymous. You know, not to get too technical, but you know, these chains essentially what the, the mining is, is happening is solving computational problem, a hashing algorithm to confirm the status of the network. Public blockchains, you can actually see hashes and transactions happening. You actually just don't see who they belong to. They're anonymous. In some use cases, that's really useful. In other use cases, that's really not. So there's issues around privacy. Which industries are these types of applications applicable to? And how should regulators think about it? And different chains take different approaches. And you've seen a proliferation over the last year or two. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the space evolves. But now as we kind of move out of the financial context to broader application context, lots of these questions have yet to be solved. Building on that theme, you know, this is a, a snapshot from you know, a popular website, coinmarketcap.com, which shows the state of the cryptocurrency market and token market, how much value in general, how many outstanding tokens, what's the price per share in some sense of each of these different chains, different chains that that token or crypto ownership will mean different things. But in general, it's a claim on, you know, some amount of value or some ability to run a, a distributed system for some period of time to do a thing. Uh, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash or Litecoin are focused on transferring financial value, uh, Ethereum on running decentralized applications. Some of these other projects on different use cases, Internet of Things, financial services. Um, you've seen a, a tremendous amount of capital flow into the space to fund and invest in these projects, basically as a claim on potential compute power and the ability to run these applications. Today, that market stands, and I think I took this snapshot yesterday, of, you can see at the top a market cap of around $325 billion. Um, Around the end of last year, beginning of this year, it was closer to 800 billion. And the number of projects in this space continues to multiply, that value becomes greater and greater. Again, there's no silver bullet taxonomy to the space. Um, this is again, a way I like to think about the space. And if you go back one slide, you'll see a number of cryptocurrencies that exist today, over a thousand. Um, they have pretty different flavors and pretty different use cases. You know, so, some things to think about, you know, and if you, if you explore the space and the way I think about it is, you know, there's some projects that are focused solely as currency, mediums exchange, store of value. That's really the Bitcoin case. Uh, there are other tokens that are more like Ethereum and participants in the network on, who are generally called utility tokens that say, hey, I want to buy something that lets me you know, run a distributed application that has some utility to the holder of that token, almost like and they're called tokens, kind of conjuring up the image of going on the subway and putting in a coin to, to use it. 
very similar concept here. And then there are other tokens that might be construed as securities under SEC guidance. Um, and I put guidance in quotes here because if you follow these debates, there is still a tremendous amount of regulatory uncertainty in this space, uh, partly brought about by a lack of clarity yet from regulators, both in the U.S. and abroad. And so where to draw that line between is it a utility, is it a security, if it's security, who can buy it, what kind of rules need to be to protect investors is quite blurry. If it, there's increasingly amount of debate and interest on tokenized assets, um, which, which I view differently than securities tokens, because securities tokens you can kind of think of, or the way I think about it is assets natively issued to a blockchain uh, that have some mix of utility and maybe cash flow claim characteristics. Tokenized assets are really a stock, a bond, real estate, other assets in a cryptographic form. You know, there's no reason you can't have a, a token running through a blockchain or distributed ledger system that represents any of those products. And it's particularly interesting for illiquid products that are very difficult to trade, take a long time to sell, have lots of legal issues around them. Real estate is one project that gets a lot of buzz, or asset class that gets a lot of buzz. Uh, and thinking about, well, can we improve liquidity, bring down liquidity and risk premiums for some of these projects, and, and have a greater supply of real estate, as an example? Make it easier for individuals to invest. And so something that many of us in the space are interested in exploring are these tokenized asset markets. There's lots of custodial legal risk issues to consider. But I think more and more you, you see even just by this taxonomy that would start as Bitcoin is growing into a, a more diverse, more rich ecosystem uh, that any of us can trade and get access to. I, I wanted to share a little bit about pros and cons, it really in the context of, especially recently in the news, Noriel Rubini, Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, other traditional financial services professional, some of the participants in the world that I come from originally um, in, in the banking world, why there's skepticism of cryptocurrencies and why there's so much excitement. And, and you know, where we go as an industry and the community in this space is going to be a function of perhaps solving some of the issues, concerns, cons. And again, I have it in quotes because I tend to believe a lot of these things are solvable that are limiting adoption at the moment. And it's important, I believe, for participants in the space to recognize that a lot of these concerns are real and limiting and think about easy ways to solve them. So why are people generally excited about the crypto space? besides the ability just to treat it. <clears throat> you know, this idea of no central counterparties sources of truth, if you think about Lehman Brothers, the financial crisis as an example, you know, the way the old traditional financial system works, if I want to trade anything, I'm going through a big hub. Lehman in 2008 was one of those hubs. Something happens with a few counterparties of Lehman, all of a sudden that central hub goes down and there's contagion through the rest of the system. And so not only do you get you know, less risky system, um, more secure system in a crypto world uh, from financial services context, but you also get uh, ideally lower fees, lower transactions. Any of us can be our own bank. Any of us can trade with anybody else. No longer do I need to go to a specific institution to facilitate, I can do it myself. Greater access, greater control, lower transactions, more security and privacy in theory. We'll touch on that in a second. And I think more and more you see the, the industry shifting in this space to the recognition that a world in which that happens or more in control of our own financial or application destiny is not incompatible with more right with, with some regulation and, and oversight and smart regulation and oversight. Um, you know, I think there's a recognition in the industry that you know, number one, that financial services regulation exists for a reason to make sure that individual investors 
aren't taken advantage of by folks that might want to take advantage of them. And I think there's an increasing recognition as well, and I know this from my, my own personal experience working closely with a number of US and international financial regulators, that the incentives actually align in more cases than not where the concept of decentralized, less risk, lower fee, greater access, greater control sound a lot like uh, the mandates of the SEC uh, and other regulatory bodies. And it's a question of how do we get there? How do we get there is gonna be addressing some of the cons. And again, sort of, you know, I put it in quotations because I think these are solvable problems, but they're, they are issues that exist today. Uh, and maximizing adoption and usefulness of this space. You know, number one, security and privacy. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but you might have heard about hacking incidents at certain exchanges. That because certain chains are public, they're not anonymous, it gives, leads to privacy concerns. Volatility, again, something we'll talk about more in depth in a moment from a trading perspective. Most of these assets are very volatile today. It's hard to spend Bitcoin on a thing because Bitcoin might be worth a dollar today, 10 bucks tomorrow, 50 cents the day after. Scalability. How many transactions can these, these networks handle today? Uh, dovetails a little bit with mining. Uh, there are limitations in the current technology, like any new technology. There are teams looking to solve it. Uh, but it's going to take time. And then finally, use cases. Um, something you hear a lot about in this space is sometimes blockchain referred to as a solution looking for a problem. And I think there's some truth to it where not every application under the sun will blockchain be a good solution for it. You know, blockchains in general, if, you, if, if a network makes sense to be distributed, blockchain cryptography is a great solution for it. Not every network, not every problem, application, industry is that really applicable to. Um, maybe there are ways that they are applicable we don't know about yet. Maybe time will tell and prove some of us wrong. I do think there needs to be a recognition that there is sometimes a little bit of a square peg in a round hole feeling. And as the space evolves, some of those issues will need to be sorted out. <clears throat> so let, let's, that's sort of the, the broad context of the landscape, the space, how some of this stuff works. I want to talk, start to talk a little bit more in the trading context with some stylized facts about if you're a trader uh, and are focused on the financial value of either now or in the future of some of these products. What are some things to be thinking about as you look to develop your own trading strategy? Number one, I think this is something everybody knows and gets everybody excited about trading in this space is volatility. Uh, so this chart, if you look on the left-hand side, that scale is for the S&P and for commodities index. Right-hand side is Bitcoin, almost 10 times more volatile on an annualized basis with extreme peaks and valleys. I think from a, from a trader perspective, this is a, a, a beautiful picture. If you're someone who, who wants to trade and wants to take risk and positions, volatility is king. Um, and a volatile market provides lots of opportunities. That volatility is not static. <clears throat> it changes over time. So this is from about mid last year to where we are today. And you'll see, um, if you follow crypto markets, you saw a considerable run up in the value of many of these products up to that $800 billion total to market cap at the end of last year. Uh, you see obviously in a run up like that, volatility goes down, but you see a considerable change in volatility profile over time. Um, on a risk adjusted basis, you've seen also, again, a change over time, uh, where early in the life cycle of Bitcoin, extremely high returns, uh, and especially in the last year, again, on a risk adjusted basis, a sharp ratio return over volatility basis, quite attractive um, on one of the measures that many financial services professionals look at. Again, thinking about the trading context and wanting to put together a well-balanced, diverse portfolio, another reason that folks are interested in crypto assets is their lack of correlation with traditional assets. Uh, if you look, whether it's over the past five years or the past year, S&P, credit, commodities, indices, 
uh, Bitcoin shows very little to almost no correlation. So if you are thinking about from a portfolio diversification benefit, there is a potential opportunity there. Uh, how exactly you structure that portfolio, what products, what time horizon varies. Uh, it can have an impact on what that looks like. So, you know, this slide is taken from a JP Morgan report earlier this year. Uh, looked at if you were to switch 1% of your traditional 6% equity, 40% book to Bitcoin, you'd have portfolio efficiency over improvement over a multi year period. But Bitcoin, because it's volatile, you, sometimes it will make your portfolio better off, sometimes worse off. Uh, we'll have to see how the space evolves. But again, something to consider that adding Bitcoin to your portfolio is not a panacea to higher returns. <clears throat> we talked a little bit earlier about the, the volume in the crypto space, the proliferation of different products. Right now, you still see that these products are very highly correlated. So you know, it can be a little hard to read the numbers on this slide, but the point is you know, red is closer to one. All of the crypto assets on the left and right hand and the top scales are very red, very correlated. Uh, so this market tends to still move in one big piece and tends to go as Bitcoin goes. There are different times where it breaks that. Uh, but in general, this market is still pretty new, pretty young. And like any new young marketplace without a lot of participants in it, the assets in that marketplace are quite highly correlated. And the number of those assets are growing. Uh, you know, so in 2017, you saw the phenomenon of what's, what's termed an ICO, like initial coin offering. And what this is, is, you know, new cryptocurrencies, digital assets that are issued to the marketplace. Sometimes they raise money for projects, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes built on top of other chains, sometimes not. Uh, and so, and they each have their own different use cases. And so you saw there are different figures on how you measure it. You know, you saw, let's say, roughly four billion in ICOs and new products released last year. That billion, that that number is only increasing. Uh, and so you've seen closer by this measure, nine billion this year, and we're only as of this slide in May. Uh, and so you know, there's lots of talk about how the space is potentially disrupting venture capital. ICOs are one way that that might potentially happen. Uh, but in general, as this the space is growing, and so that 300 odd million market cap is only increasing um, as more and more companies, projects, people look to do things in the space and bring distributed applications to market. There's lots of different sectors you can think about in this space. And so, again, going back to especially that concept introduced by Ethereum of different use cases, different potential applications, different projects, different ICOs in the space, look at different pieces uh, and try to tackle different problems. So, you know, myself specifically, the ocean, we look at the financial services context, Big ICO project this earlier this year was Telegram, which raised almost $2 billion, the majority of communications on this slot. Uh, you know, governance, gaming has come on quite quickly. How can you create protocols for people to trade products that exist in a, in a digital world, um, you know, a, a gaming world? Lots of different potential applications are distributed in ledger technology, blockchain technology, lots of people looking at the space lots of projects that are promising, some that are not. And so again, this contributes to the volatility and the ability to create different exposures and, and have different risks and invest in different products. And this sort of dovetails then into trading opportunities. Um, again, we've talked about how this stuff works, um, how the space generally looks very volatile, lots of projects, lots of projects being added to the space, no clear cut winners, very young marketplace. What does that mean for us as algorithmic traders? What can we do in this space? So I just want to highlight a few things to think about. Again, not advocating for one strategy over the other, but you know, someone as who's been an algorithmic trader for a long time sees certain patterns and thinks there are ways to potentially um, make trades that are favorable in that environment.
So first, exchange spreads. So if you think about any young marketplace, it's still being developed, roadmaps or, or runways into that world, onboard and offboard, run, uh, on ramps uh, is the word I was looking for. Um, regulations still unclear in different and different jurisdictions. There are considerable spreads for the same product across different exchanges. Something we'll get into is again a little bit of mark, market microstructure where you know there are reasons why technically too it's not easy to arbitrage some of these products. So spreads that you would never even fantasize about in the stock market context are present here in the, the crypto market. So this is an example of Bitcoin. You can see on the left hand side a selection from some of the largest exchanges in the world. You'll see a spread of over 100 basis points, and this exists. For, and you can see on the on the chart above for a many hour, many day continues to exist period. You know, structural reasons why this hasn't closed yet, but this is an opportunity. So an opportunity not just in Bitcoin, but across products. And you'll see uh, again on the left hand side under currencies, you'll see Bitcoin, Dash, EOS, you know, paired against a, a different currency on different exchanges. Again, considerable spreads. And there are considerable exchanges to potentially arbitrage across. So it's a little small, I apologize, but you'll see top 15 exchanges by volume. Um, you know, the number of markets that they trade in, some specialize like Bitflyer and Bitcoin, others in the full suite of crypto products. Um, because they cover different jurisdictions, different times of day, this is actually a 24 hour market, uh, operates 24 hours a day. Um, caters as different types of investors and traders. You can see considerable divergence in activity and exposure in volatility in, in other factors of the marketplace uh, across exchanges. So we talk a little bit about arbitrage. Um, there is, if you search online you'll see uh, there's an increasing number of papers that are being published on what's the ability of you know, traditional algorithmic te te techniques, time series prediction, machine learning, natural language processing to think about this market. Uh, I, on this slide the following one I've sort of pulled just two examples. You know this this example from a paper by Amjad and Shah you know, looks at a few different potential models that were used to predict the uh, price of Bitcoin and then make trades against it. A couple things I wanted to point out. Number one is large dispersion and the ability of some of these algorithms to be successful. Number two is changes over time. Um, you know, and so as this market matures, I would expect to see different approaches become better or worse no different than uh, any other market or any other algo that you put into production. Um, but something, again, the, the, the techniques that are used traditionally to trade stocks, FX, other products also show some value in this space. Something I want to point out as well from a machine learning or market microstructure perspective, you get a very young market um, not a lot of big players in it yet, though there are some. Uh, lots of, you know, retail individual traders. As a result of that, you can see certain patterns in order books that, as an algorithmic trader, you might be able to think about embedding in your strategy. You know, so this paper, you took a look at short-term price fluctuations from buy and sell orders. Again, no different than what you might do in a traditional financial markets context. I've seen approaches like this, as many of us have, in stock market, and FX, and other markets. This is just, again, another example of you know, taking algorithm strategies that apply in an old world that also works in this world. Uh, and again, something to think about, particularly FX and stock market strategies. You know, my own experience and experience of others can be successful in this space if you take advantage, or rather than take advantage, you find solutions for some of the challenges in the space. 
Um, and when I say solutions, uh, I don't mean that there are silver bullets. I think, again, thinking about this being a relatively immature market, some of the things that if you're an active algorithmic trader in stocks or FX or elsewhere, that you knew and thought were solved long ago haven't really been solved necessarily in this space because of the nature of the technology. Let's talk about a few examples. <clears throat> First, uh, transaction times. And so going back to the beginning of this presentation, we've talked about how blockchains work. You know, blockchains work by distributed networks, a distributed set of computers, solving algorithms to update the status of the network for transactions. That takes time. Depends on how many computers you have running, how difficult is the hash, how complex is the transaction, and so on. You'll see at different times, and this is public information, you can go to publicblockchain.com and poke around at the status of the, the public Bitcoin blockchain. The mempool size, which is the the, the transactions waiting to be confirmed size, you know, the bytes there, uh, is pretty volatile. It changes depending on how many people are trying to trade or use the network to do something. Uh, and so during times of high volatility and high trading, the, the ability to settle and trade can actually diminish quite considerably. And this is goes to sort of that generation three problem of blockchains of how do you solve some of the scaling problems? Well, this is one of the big scaling problems in the space of there's a lot of talk about the lightning network specifically bitcoin and, and other approaches uh to solve some of this problem but if you wanted to replace visa which processes many hundreds of thousands of transactions a second bitcoin can't yet do that uh nor can it's more you know hundreds uh on a matter of seconds if that and so this is a fundamental problem to think about in the context of trading, uh, particularly if you're an arbitrage trader, that your settlement for transaction times might vary considerably. And that's true in Bitcoin. Um, you know, that dovetails into fees. Um, you know, miners, the people who are trying to determine and use their compute power to process transactions, get rewarded in the in terms of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies for solving and, and renting out their compute power, depending on how many computers are active and how active is the network, then the, not just the time, but the cost, how much you pay actually can change a lot as well. And it's true on Ethereum as well. So this is scanned from Ether gas station. <clears throat> you know, it, it, you know, there are different you know, speeds at which you can settle transactions depending on the platform you're using. So again, there's, there are issues in network congestion, specifically on Ethereum, and you might have heard of CryptoKitties last year, earlier this year. You know, as the space evolves and more people get in it, unless you solve scaling issues at the same rate, there's some slowdowns, there's some additional costs. And something to keep in mind, particularly if you're an arbitrage or other algorithmic trader, that where you might typically model transaction costs and transaction times as fixed, they can vary in this world. Exchange stability. This is from the cryptocurrency exchange Kraken. One example where they updated their API for performance issues. API worked well, quite well for some period of time and then started to degrade. Exchanges in this space, again, very new. Uh, some people have financial services background that are operating them, some do not. Uh, and so you'll see different levels of performance on them. Again, something where you might assume that the traditional financial world is taken care of. There are exchange outages, API connectivity issues, um, fundamental interface issues that need to be solved still in the space that can uh, limit your trading experience and ability. Very concentrated market still today. Again, very young. As the slide points out, you'll see different estimates, a little bit of this number as well. 4% of all Bitcoin addresses hold 97% of all Bitcoin. So the market can still move with some whales and whales will travel, you know, trade on different exchanges and maybe hide their activity or maybe not. So again, a little bit different than other markets that you might see. I pointed this out, not again, to 
particularly pick on or have a strong view on whether it's true or not that some exchanges manipulate certain activity or allow manipulative activity. The point is more that this is still a largely unregulated marketplace. In a largely unregulated marketplace, you might see collusion, you might see fraudulent trading, you might not. Um, in this specific context, there's been a lot of debate around Tether, Bitfinex. I encourage you, if you're interested, to look at the specific blog, which looks at a lot of these issues. Um, you know, this is a space that's still very young, unregulated. Because of that, you might see certain activity you might not see in other marketplaces. And to that point, part of that reason is because regulation is still being developed and quite different in different parts of the world. Uh, again, you might see different views on exactly this picture on which countries are more or less liberal. I'm sort of agnostic to that point. The point I want to make here is that it is quite variable by country. Um, and so this contributes to the spreads, this contributes to volatility, uh, this contributes to use cases, uh, development. And, and so as the regulatory landscape evolves, the price and the, the development of these assets will also evolve. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about security breaches. So <clears throat> going back to why Bitcoin blockchain exists, thinking about not having centralized counterparties, these central points of risk and central points of cost for the broader financial system. If you look at cryptocurrency exchanges today, they're all largely centralized, which means that you are giving, you and depositing your coins, your Bitcoin, your tokens with the exchange, and then the exchange matches your order with somebody else's, and uh, that trade gets executed, hopefully. True in most cases, not true in all cases. You know, there are a number of instances, again, this is digital cash, so it exists natively digitally. There aren't you know, lots of ability to roll back, particularly as the chain is being built, mistakes or issues. There is no FDIC insurance equivalent in this world. And so you see many instances, Mt. Gox is probably the most famous, but there are others where certain exchanges, protocols have been hacked by uh, technologically savvy individuals who stole people's balances. Um, and a large part of that is because you know, these centralized counterparties which in some sense try to avoid in this world, but haven't figured a lot of good technological solutions around it yet that are facilitating trades, are holding the private keys, um, your specific identifier to your balance, your account on their systems and on their platforms. There's lots of talk about decentralized, which in this context means non-custodial exchanges that just match individuals to trade peer to peer, 0x in the Ethereum space is one of those protocols. My project, specifically the Ocean, is building something very similar to this, uh, or on top of this rather, to extend to traditional financial products. But this idea of non-custodial peer-to-peer exchange is, is one potential solution to a fundamental security problem, which is it's something that we hear a lot about why institutions, others are not yet in this space. So, you know, in closing of this presentation, you know, this Crypto 101 overview, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how blockchains work. Um, and that will dovetails into in the volume of projects in the space and dovetails into both opportunities and challenges. The opportunities are a volatile marketplace, still young, still opportunities to trade and trade profitably. The flip side is because the technology is still young growing quickly, not necessarily regulated consistently, not necessarily secure consistently. Uh, there are challenges that you as a trader need to think about in your own risk reward profile uh, and your own mechanisms that you create for yourself, especially if you're trading algorithmically. What you wanna do, how you wanna account for them. Uh, and no one has the perfect or right answer just yet. And we're all, whether you're a trader, investor, developer, technologist in the space, learning. Uh, I hope that you learned something from this presentation. Um, 
and I'm happy to address questions as people have it. Thanks so much, John. Um, we've gotten some questions, so if you want to kick it off with that, um, if you have a question, please put it in the questions uh, side tab, and we will do our best to get to it. Yes, please. I encourage people to to do that. I'll start by answering some of the questions that were submitted during the talk, and I'll kind of just go down the list here. So, uh, does it, you know, first question. Doesn't the distributed ledger have its capacity limit? What are the problems that problems need to solve during Bitcoin mining? So, good question. So, this gets a little bit to what is called sort of a 51% attack. So, in computer science or distributed networks, a concern is that certain hackers or certain individuals could take over the network and change the balances of the individual. So the distributed network is only as good as its compute power. If someone takes over 51% of the network, well, they could you know, race ahead in creating this blockchain, mining blocks, and submit the transactions and values that they want in front of it. Let's say I took 51% percent, percent of the Bitcoin blockchain. I could just say, well, let me put all the Bitcoin in my account. I have more compute power than everybody else trying to solve the hashing algorithm that's building consensus and locking cryptographically the balances. I win. You know, blockchains are sort of the canonical blockchain is a, is a little bit of a race in compute power. The way the way you're solving or protecting against this attack is by making problems sufficiently difficult and getting enough computers working on these problems that no one human being or collection of human beings could easily take over that compute power. It's a little bit of a brute force approach. Uh, because of that, I, I wouldn't really say it has a capacity limit. It's more of a computational limit. That's one of the reasons you talk, you, you hear a lot about energy concerns in the in the mining space, where for building more and more complex algorithms, we need the chain gets bigger and bigger. We need more and more computers to validate it. It takes more time. Um, well, that energy consumption becomes great. Is that really efficient? Is proof of work efficient? So there's lots of talk of proof of stake, hybrid approaches. How, how otherwise can you get people together to solve these problems and make consistent votes, let's call it, without getting too levered to any one individual? And, and so something that's really interesting to me, at least in this space, is, is the idea of governance. You start to see a lot of debate in this project around who has voting power through mining. It's, it starts to talk and sound a lot like politics and democracy. And I think something that lots of people are excited about in this space is it's almost a rethink of how we, as human, buying, human beings, excuse me, incentivize and work together. Blockchains, crypto are one lens into that world. So thanks for that question. I'll, I'll continue to take them as they appear on, on my screen. Um, you know, so are Bitcoin's digital currencies being used for direct payments yet, i.e. Venmo, Circle, and Apple Pay? There have been some attempts. Um, you know, so Square, I know, last year had said that they would take crypto payments, uh, process crypto payments. Uh, they actually discontinued that service. One of the fundamental issues is volatility. Um, I, I think it's it's still hard for folks to spend money in a crypto format, particular good or service directly, because when you go to pay, maybe it's worth a dollar. When the other person receives it, maybe it's worth 50 cents. And when they go to pay, maybe it's worth $2. There are different approaches called stable coins trying to solve that problem. There are also technological approaches, state channels, lightning network, they're also trying to tackle that problem. I, I would say it's one of the biggest debates in the space is how do we eventually move from, you know, being able to trade Bitcoin to Bitcoin to Bitcoin to fiat. Uh, and it's something that hasn't been solved yet, uh, but there's lots of people in the space looking to solve it. Um, is it true that each transaction creates another block to the blockchain? Isn't there a limit of plot possible blocks within the blockchain? So the first part of that question, 
Um, typically the way it works, and it, it varies by chain, but you know, cert a certain number of transactions can be packed into a block. And so if you think about you know, an earlier slide, you know, I'm going back to transaction times around Bitcoin and the mempool. You know, the mempool is waiting transactions. So a certain number of transactions, a certain number of bytes can be packed into each block. And so depending on the size of specifics of transactions, a number of different, some number of transactions can be packed into each individual block. But there isn't, at least to my knowledge, and I'm, I'm not an expert in cryptography or, or blockchains as, as much of an expert as others. There is no, to my knowledge, theoretical limit on the number of blocks a chain could have. It starts to become a, a computational, almost processing problem at that point, whereas this mempool size grows as more people trying to use it. I need to add more and more computers to bring down the time to do it, which means more and more power consumption. I also need to, as more and more people are getting onto the system, I need to protect the consensus. I need to make it more difficult to solve the algorithms to bring consensus. And so you start to run into the upper bounds of what computers can do. No different than you did 80s, 90s, 2000s of you know, couldn't do quantum computing in 1980. Um, so I think, I think more of the blockchain scalability questions are around less what's a theoretical chain length limitation is based on the current state of computers, how big can we grow these chains and are there mechanisms that we can bring down the cost, energy consumption of those platforms. Um, I'm jumping around questions a little bit. Um, so, would you say that blockchain is like a platform and cryptocurrency is like an app? For example, Facebook is the platform, there are apps built on that platform. I would say it depends on the chain. Uh, I, I would say Ethereum is very much functions like that, um, where Ethereum, there's a core chain settlement layer, let's call it. Um, you know, On that chain, there's a native cryptocurrency, Ethereum, that runs the Ethereum virtual machine. And that if you push applications to that machine, um, it processes them. And then people look to build applications, some with their own native cryptocurrency or token on top of it. So one example um, is you know, Gollum, Augur, Omaisgo, who are looking at prediction markets, financial services in different contexts. They're built on top of Ethereum. You know, Omaisgo, for example, is, is looking specifically at how do I extend banking services to unbanked people. Uh, it has its own native token that incentivizes, uh, you know, that was issued in, in, in Ethereum format to help incentivize people to use the product and to develop that product. Uh, and there are other cryptocurrencies like Zcash and Monero that operate a little bit like Ethereum or Facebook. And so there's different flavors. Um, you know, and so I, I, would, I, would, I would say that there, there are blockchains that operate like platforms um, that applications would be built on top of, but it's not all blockchains. It depends really on the use case and what the... Um, what the specific needs are. Um, you know, how can people estimate a kind of fair value for Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other crypto? Uh, I, I won't give a specific recommendation here. Um, what I will say is that there are lots of different, different competing viewpoints. And I think that's sort of shown by, you know, the debates around pros and cons a little bit, where depending on what you believe is a greater pro or a greater con, different products, use cases might be more or less valuable. <clears throat> you know, I've heard lots of talk of Bitcoin as sort of the equivalent of a Swiss bank account in a new world. What's the value of that? Well, it depends on, on how you think about maybe that concept of a Swiss bank account in the Bitcoin context. 
others, and that's, there's a little bit more of a store of value concept others talk about as a medium exchange. So depending on the use case, depending on the approach, there's lots of different frameworks to think about. If you go to you know, the ocean medium as one example, um, you know, we have a collection of sources for people to take a look at and how you might think about valuing. But there is no, with any new asset, uh, there is no silver bullet approach. It will take time to see what products you know, increase in value and which decrease and what that can say about valuing the space at large. Um, after you have developed your trading strategies, what are your methods of implementation across multiple exchanges? I have found this process to be very time consuming. Well, I, I, I will agree with that statement. And so, and this dovetails a few other questions I'm seeing about APIs. So, this is a mix of no new industry, no standards you know, from a technical perspective, no standards from a regulatory perspective, different approaches, different philosophies on how to build specific systems, who's building them from a trading perspective. You know, I'll speak solely from the ocean's perspective of totally agree that it's hard to get onboarded to many crypto exchanges. I'm somebody who comes from you know, the Goldman Sachs world where I've built a lot of these systems, try to make them as user friendly as possible, good libraries, so on and so forth. You'll find different standards on different platforms. Uh, there's no real silver bullet solution except to you know, try to work within the context and abilities that the exchanges have provided and give feedback and work active as a community. You know, something that's really great about the crypto space at large, still relatively small, is that there's most projects, whether you're developing a blockchain, cryptocurrency, or looking to trade, many of them are open source. Um, you know, there's a proliferation of cryptocurrency bots and others that you know, other pieces of code that have been written, published publicly on GitHub or elsewhere. Um, it's a great starting point. Um, I would say, unfortunately, the space, because it is still young and new, it's not easy to connect to every exchange. Some exchanges are easier to others. Um, hopefully, there are projects that, like ours and, and the ocean and, and others that will make it easier for folks to get into the marketplace for a variety of reasons. Um, let me take one more question because we're, we're running low on time. Um, so uh, it's kind of a, a amalgam of some of the questions I'm seeing about, you know, Governments, regulations, consumption. A debate and a theme in the space is how easy, useful, desirable is it to create a distributed system that no one controls? How does that marry up with the, the traditional world, whether you're in a financial product sense or not, that's you know, whether it's governments or companies backstop certain products, how do I reconcile between these two views? And I think it's a, it's a debate and a, and a conversation that myself and, and others are having with regulators in the space where they are conflicted too. Something I find very interesting is the IMF, other governments have said, hey, we actually want to explore cryptocurrencies, blockchains for issuing traditional fiat government-backed currency. It provides an interesting ability to have the pulse on the wheel of the economy a little bit. Well, does that really make sense in a distributed format, number one? Is it compatible with what the technology is actually really trying to do? But is it a desirable outcome when many people, I'm not saying I would specifically, but there are others and many people in the space that might say, well, did that centralized government do a good job doing that in the first place? Um, should we do something like an algorithmic central bank that we let computers and, and others, you know, computers or cryptography or algorithms run more of the financial or other systems? It's the same sort of debate 
nothing dissimilar to what you see in AI and machine learning. I think what's interesting about that debate is that you know, regulators and governments are incentivized to actually make things less risky, less centralized too, in many cases. Um, financial services cases is the case I know best where having Lehman Brothers 2.0 is a net bad thing. The question is how do you get there? The right pace, what are the trade-offs between centralized and decentralized networks? And how, if you wanna to move to more decentralized world, how do you create the right safeguards, uh, the right regulatory framework? And in, in, in my view, at least speaking personally, I think that needs to be a dialogue between participants in the ecosystem, uh, the crypto ecosystem, and regulators. Some take the approach of not working actively with regulators or governments. I can understand that approach. It's not the approach that I take. Um, I think it's more beneficial to the space, more beneficial to people looking to adopt, more beneficial to governments and companies in the space to work actively in deciding these trade-offs and the right balance. And part of that is governments recognizing that old ways might not work in new world. And part of it is new companies, blockchain companies recognizing that the concerns of the old world are in some cases valid. It's so how do we meet in the middle somewhere is sort of the perspective I have on it. And I think with that, you know, I wanted to end uh, the presentation. I certainly appreciate the thoughtful questions. Uh, I enjoy putting this presentation together and sharing it with you all. And I hope that I at least, if you were on the fence about learning more about this space, uh, you are off the fence and, and you'll jump in as I have and others have on trading it and, and being active participant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we did get quite a few questions, so if we couldn't answer your question, you can always send it to events at quantopian.com, and we will do our best to hand that over um, to John. Um, but thank you again, and this was recorded, and we will be sending all of you the link.